Welcome back, everyone. The Cube's live coverage here in Denver, Colorado. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube, here for three days, getting right, winding down day three. You got two great guests. Thomas is here. He's the VP and GM of APJ for Boomi. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you. Brett is the CIO for the Australian Red Cross customer customer conversations. Brett, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right. So first of all, let's set the context up. You guys are a customer at Boomi. What's going on? Give us an update on what you guys do. Red Cross, people can pretty figure it out, but what your use case are and, and, and what you're trying to solve. Yeah, so great question. I think, so Australian Red Cross is, operates across the, the work globe against another 192 national societies. We provide emergency and disaster relief as also community support as well. So really important focus around what we do. Um, Red Cross, Australian Red Cross has been through a, a significant digital transformation over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. And we've looked at and created sort of that digital foundation. We did seven platforms in 12 months. And so quite an optimistic target, but we've achieved it and come out the other side. Now we're really focusing around how do we leverage off sort of emerging technologies that are coming through, such as AI. Ease of use has been probably one of the big things that we hear a lot in, in situations where tech's involved, especially in cultures where on the on APJ market, it's not the same as North America, is it? And or what are their needs? I mean, we've seen people doing things a little bit differently in North America versus APJ. Thomas, what's the market like for you guys out there? No, it's it's a really phenomenal opportunity. I mean, I think most people in North America probably can sort of relate to what's happening in APJ, but not exactly. So if you take Australia, for example, the COVID situation was much more amplified there and much more of a extended duration. Uh, and they even had rules where people couldn't travel between various Stats. counties and states. Yep. So you were literally landlocked and then I think as you go broader into Southeast Asia, they're not, they're, their digitization is non-existent back then. And so uh, all of these organizations are in the quest to catch up uh, to not go through that ever again. And so uh, it's a really exciting time for us. Right, I don't want to relive COVID because you know, I get triggered, <laughs> but you know that highlights having your ducks lined up, so to speak, get your get your data in order, understand the mechanisms you have at your disposal. Take us through your digital transformation journey. What was the catalyst? Um, was it a forcing function? Was it COVID involved? What was the, take us through your journey and the, from how it went down. Yeah, I think, look, it was a mixture of all of them, to be <laughs> honest. I think as a, uh, we're, we're living in this digital world now, and I think a lot, of, a lot of charities have not really recognized that you need to shift into that digital mode. And without doing it, you, you will still operate, but you won't be as efficient as fast as you can be. And I guess where we need to look at is, how do you create efficiency and how do we optimize the business as well? So we looked at creating that digital foundation, that digital spine. Um, data is a key piece for us. So data flows. Um, obviously in and out of different systems. So whilst we created this digital spine or foundation, we still have 240 C leg legacy apps. And Dip Boomi sits in between all those is creating that conduit between sort of legacy and modern technology and is doing a fantastic job around managing those data flows as well. To expand more on the, on the architecture and the topology of the systems um, across multiple geographies. Yep. Um, Data centers. What was there was a little more color on the on the so layout. We've shifted away um, from actually having in data centers, so we're 100% in the cloud now. Um, but I think one of the key things for us is we went a platform approach. So for us, it was around how do we get more out of a platform rather than best of breed, and that's worked really well for us because what that means is we can leverage off data that sits across multiple platforms, but obviously surface it to staff and, and end users, especially when they're out on the field as well. So you went cloud for agility. And Agility, speed, and efficiency. And you're happy with that move? Yeah, and I think it's, it's but it's also managing cloud costs. It's one of the key <laughs> things that I think we're seeing at the moment around that sprawl around cloud. So it's making sure that you do manage those costs because it's so easy to spin up another, another service or something else like that, and you don't see the cost till the end of the month. It's like leaving the faucet on. You don't want to like, correct. Yeah, you know, that's happened to us many times. We're a small company, we're like, whoa! You know, so, but this is a good point. Cost optimization has been a big uh, driver, but now with AI, you start to see that, it's not so much repatriation or thinking like that's cut costs, it's more of I want to maximize the efficiency of the spend and make sure I'm investing in other areas like Gen AI is one hot area. We see people taking from one budget going to the other. How are you guys looking at that, uh, that, that kind of now next generation task? Because Gen AI has opportunities but also risks. Talk about cost optimization. You solve the cloud problem. Yep. I mean the AI could be a gigantic sink hole for cash if you don't if you don't get it right. So again another another you know challenge with AI is cost side on that too. 
And I think it's it's about picking the right use cases that are really going to offer the most amount of benefits. Yeah. And we do a, a fairly stringent cost benefit analysis at the start of everything we do. We only have a limited amount of funding. So for us, it's really important that we re- redirect those funds into the right areas that are going to give us some really great outcomes. And looking at um, the keynote yesterday from Steve is some of the pieces in there, which is sort of like around the Gen AI, yeah. around... Um, being able to look at obviously agents and data flows is a really interesting point from us because it removes the requirement for having a, a really technical resources to more of a business analyst who can help us along those ways. As yeah, well. I think that, I think one of the things that's come out of the boomy boomy world here is the clear validation that yeah. data and workflows for a company yeah. is their intellectual property. That's right, and right. that speak and you, and you don't want to put I won't say poison that integrate that with a hallucinogen, mm. aka a model that might not be a hundred percent accurate. Because if you're running operations, yep, and you got relief on the line, you have major critical system to deliver. You, and if we doing that, right? Sorry. Now you go ahead. I should say undoing the bad learnings, right? Yeah. Unlearning toughest part right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think the second part to that is that it's not a batch process; it's a continuous process, yeah. which has a lot different load on the whole infrastructure. Mm-hmm. What do you oh, and, and just to, in addition to that, I think is yeah. if we're out in the field making decisions on the fly with real-time data and the decision, the, the data being fed in is wrong, um, or yeah. AI decides to make a, a slightly different t- tweak to it, it could impact what we're actually doing yeah. on the ground. I mean, I think you guys, not to kind of go on in rat hole here, but or t- and go in the rabbit hole, you guys are a great example of what I call tactical edge mm. execution. Mm. You have to be tactical, mm. real time with data, Everything's got to be perfect. That's hard. Yeah. That's not easy. It's Where's a, the synchronization of the data? Is it highly available or highly high availability? I mean, those words mean something in, in, in tech. Where's the data being stored? Is it updated? Is and the also, app working? Think, What's the latency? And who has access to that information yeah. is really is important. Yeah. So we move around a lot of data, yeah. obviously every time we activate, and even when we're not activated. Um, and it's making sure that we don't uh, potentially put the wrong data of, say, donors or someone we're, we're helping as well in the wrong spot that then someone has access to it as well. All right, so i got to ask you, so you mentioned, kind of jumped ahead on me a little bit on this one, because you said you, you went right to the cloud, which I was all excited about. <laughs> love, love to hear the success. I'm liking it too, it's great. Um, we're all cloud native too, we were born in the cloud, so we didn't really have a, any legacy. Take us through the um, the transformation with, with Boomi. What what actually went down? Um, you had to go to the cloud, part of the digital transformation. What went down? Were you sunsetting existing apps? Were there data centers? Were there not data centers? Were there net new as a cloud? From yep. take us through what happened. So the journey probably started way back in 2021. We we were there was a, an audit risk around aging infrastructure, so we shifted most things to a cloud environment at that time. So that we went to more infrastructure as a service. But it was a it was a costly exercise and was to address a tactical issue that we had. We then thought about, okay, what is that longer term view, put together a, a plan around how do we get the most out of, of, of obviously the funding we have, but how do we make sure that we understand our finances, so from a, a, an ERM perspective, um, and then how do we make sure that we actively engage with our donors, and that's through marketing and CRM and marketing automation as well, and that customer data platform as well. Where Boomi kind of sat is with kind of the brain between everything. Um, so we could we could migrate data from a, a legacy system to a new platform through Boomi, which was just fantastic because then we weren't, data migration was relatively straightforward. And for us, it was the ability to clean it up as it came through. And so we weren't putting not great data that yeah. we had into a into a really modern platform as well. You didn't have to build, you didn't have to build any, much anything. No, because we already had that there and that was yeah. probably the, the key benefit. Well. This is this is Thomas one of the big nuances that's coming out on stage. I mean, Steve said it directly, but it's still not obvious to some people that you already built all this stuff. Well, uh, yes, Vishal Sika, he's a legend in the web services community. He's using Boomi. He's like, why do I want to build that? I just you go with Boomi. So again, you're starting to see this composite model of partnering to solve the problem. Do you really care that that's Boomi right. does this? It's worth it. The value you get mm. justifies. The alternative, which is do it in your own. Like I got to hire developers. I mean, it's well, also no brainer. That's right. I think the I think this notion of you know ready to go and a whole roadmap now of how you go from raw material to wherever you want to be on your digital transformation. Yeah. And we have all the componentry to do that. Uh, cloud native, hybrid, however you want. 
Well, I want to come back to the, the, what you guys were on the future, but I want to hit my yes. question earlier. I want to bring back the, the North America versus APJ. That's where you're at. Yes. Um, in my conversation with that market, those customers there, they're smaller businesses. There's no big, there's not a lot of mega businesses. It's the cloud adoption, at least from my audit and our research, shows that it's the bigger multinationals in America that have the big data centers and cloud plays. There's a lot of small, medium-sized businesses in, the, in that market. And big, well, big is but medium compared to the, the large super enterprises. So when you have these like this kind of makeup, a lot of family businesses, there's a lot, I mean, just it's a different culture. That's right. And they want speed. They don't want bureaucracy. They don't want silos. They want stuff that's going to click in and work. That's right. Is that the way it's going down? Is, am, I, am I accurate or um, what am I missing? No, I think that's a, a fair statement for where we're at, which is that whether it's a big business or a medium business, if you're early in your digital transformation, they don't want to go all in out of the gate. Whereas in America, you actually find that they'll go enterprise-wide out of the gate. And so we've been successful, to your point, in both contexts, either figuring out a phased approach or in the mid-sized business, making it so shrink-wrapped in nature and packaged that it's easy for them to say yes to. And Got it. Yes, the positioning is somewhat different, absolutely. So Brett, uh, yeah, I'm now back to you. You guys mentioned, you mentioned a little bit about the databases and stuff, okay, in the cloud. I imagine that the way you make money or, is you raise money, you get funding. Correct. So that's a process. And you got to go, no, no. Got donors, they're your, I guess your money customers. You got to go yeah. nurture them and, and, and that's the process. Is that innovation there? What are, the, what's the, what are the core use cases for you? Is that one of them? So I think for um, if you looked at previously before the transformation, we, we would send out an EDM to 250,000 supporters or donors. It would be the same EDM and it would pretty much say, would you like to re-donate to us? Now I think post-transformation is we've got some really great tools in there, um, which is about hyper-personalizing that experience. And yeah. um, so it was similar to what was obviously shown yesterday without the video where you can say, um, hi, how are you doing today? We've noticed you've been really interested around these specific topics. We're thinking you might be interested in, in donating to these specific yeah. appeals. So it becomes more connected to the brand and what we do yeah. rather than just a standard EDM that gets sent out. And the video piece that we saw yesterday yeah. within Boomi with the ability to, to, to create a video, the hyper-personalized sort of video, yeah. that was amazing. I, I think, everyone asked me what the killer app for AI is, my answer yep. is personalization. Exactly. And, and, and additive things you could deliver on top of that, net new services. I mean, you guys could even be in the media business, mm. serving them content, yeah. to keep them engaged during the entire, pro I mean, just made that up, but, I can, but if you have that kind of level of personalization, you get great speed connect, cycles of, of, yeah. of connecting feedback and understanding what people might need. Really interesting use case. So where are you guys taking it? But, but that's a good question, next question, okay. What's next? I think what's next for us is we've, we've got some great foundations in that digital spine. So we're building on top of that. So how do we make sure that we, we leverage off obviously the investment that we made, yeah. but also looking at rationalizing those 250 odd applications, the legacy that is still out there as well. And um, so for us, it's about rationalizing apps, but obviously building yeah. on top. But how do we make sure that we're looking at what's on the horizon for emerging technologies? And so for us, yeah. AI is really exciting, but we've got to make sure we're actually going to get sort of a, I guess our use case and our benefits analysis around making sure we're going to get something out of it as well. You mentioned digital spine, that word. Okay, what do you mean by that? Because that word has been used, this word spine and leaf has been around in networking. We know what that is yep. when it comes to networking. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA uses that word a lot. It implies knowledge graphs, neural networks. Is that where it is? What is, that? is that, or is that your backbone between apps? What, what is a digital spine? I think it's, it's more of that, what was that core foundation yeah. that you worked from? And it's kind of like in a human spine where you can't operate without a human spine. So for us, it's that digital spine that runs across the organization with those different platforms that we've got, and it effectively runs the whole organization. So it's kind of like that neural network that everything yeah. runs through. So, so you use like a knowledge graph, a connect, connective tissue between systems? Like that, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that, that's set up perfectly for AI. That's where it's all going. You guys are, all right, what, what's next? Next year when we're here, what are we going to talk about? What's the, what's the conversation going to be like next year? If we're at Boomi World 2025, what would be the conversation? I think it's, um, it's around how we've leveraged off more of the investment, yeah. but also around how do we leverage off AI? So AI is, is a very broad topic at the moment. And so for us, it, it is around that hyper-personalization, making yeah. sure we're engaging, but also how do we use AI to start looking as pr predictive analysis yeah. um, out in the field where we're seeing really vulnerable people and identifying areas earlier and quicker as well, or 
in the event of, um, say, a, a fire or a yeah. flood, um, we might be able to then leverage off other data sets and bring it together yeah. and give us an idea where we should really focus our efforts. Yeah, I mean, technology for good is a great use case. You have a tactical edge mm. use case to put the tech parlance on it, but the impact is significant. Getting the right data at the right time, putting things in the right place is all about that digital spine. And again, you know, that, that term is probably going to be more used as people realize that, like NVIDIA used it at their big event, um, showing how they bring all their clusters together. Mm -hmm. And what it is is essentially the backbone of a new system architecture. Yep. And that's going to be fundamental for making sure data's moving fast yeah. and everyone's connected. You know, like when I'm at the gym, I try to keep my spine nice and straight, all the muscles mm -hmm. working in together. I mean, it's like being in shape. It is, it is, definitely. And that's, that's where we're hoping to get to as well. Brett, thanks so much for going to Thomas. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Got a great territory, a great customer. Thank thanks for sharing the story. Thanks Thank you. So much. All right. Thanks for having okay, us. Okay, this is theCUBE live here at Boomi World. Thanks for watching. I'm John Furrier. We'll be right, be right back after this short break. Thanks. Bye.